Hello, welcome to the very first Elosmo Bronk Evolution podcast. This will be a special episode today, or at least noteworthy, in that we're going to be discussing one of the biggest shark turnover events of all time, especially among modern sharks. We're talking about the same extinction event, very nasty that wiped out all non-avian dinosaurs, all of the mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, pterodactyls, hybodont sharks that were still kicking, and a whole lot of ocean life, including sharks. I think there's a misunderstanding that sharks have been around for hundreds of millions of years unchanged, and that's not true. Although they have the same basic body structure and the types of scales and teeth relatively, they've changed over time and none of the modern species have been around since the time of the dinosaurs. Although in the Mesozoic, the time of the dinosaurs, there were sharks that were very, very similar, especially among the highly predatory, large lamniform sharks. Basically, if you look at a great white, that's basically your tip highly predatory lamniform shark. And back in the Mesozoic, there were no great whites, but there were very similar sharks of that order that over the mid to late Cretaceous were very, very successful, even among being beside the large sea lizards, the mosasaurs. There are all kinds of large bony fish that were really good hunters, like Cephactinus, resembled basically a highly predatory tarpon-like fish. They originally thought they were tarpon, but now I believe they're something else. But anyways, by the end of the Cretaceous, all those large sharks with those big, serrated, specialized, well, relatively specialized, even though sharks will pretty much eat anything, those big special teeth pretty much completely disappeared by the end of the Cretaceous, along with a whole bunch of other life. And we'll get into the papers. They predict or estimate the percentage of sharks and rays that went extinct and how sharks fared in the very beginning of the next time period, which would become the age of mammals, quote unquote, but also a special time for sharks as they began to rebound. And we'll also get into what adaptations they had to actually survive the event when so many other types of animals completely went extinct. So it's not all doom and gloom, even though you had plenty of sharks, plenty of rays, and a whole bunch of ocean life that just completely became extinct. We had to look at the big picture. Yeah, sure, they were hit hard, but they're such adaptable, resilient groups that they just cannot be completely wiped out. I'm convinced sharks, if they survived the end Permian that wiped out over 95% of all life, they couldn't become extinct with that. I believe it's going to take a whole lot more, something completely out of this world to completely erase sharks from the face of the planet, which is good, but it all depends on the extinction rates because sure, they might not be completely wiped out, but if enough change happens too quickly and it's not natural, there's other consequences and go on in the present. And we'll get into that. So what was going on 66 million years ago to wipe out all these sharks, all these dinosaurs, all these reptiles, and probably mammals too that were around. They only got so big, but I know it definitely hurt them too, as well as marine invertebrates. Well, people don't know for sure. Scientists can only hypothesize, but the leading theory seems to be the impact in the Yucatan Peninsula. A huge meteor struck around Mexico I forget the exact number of how much megatons of dynamite is equivalent to. Definitely locally, it wiped out a whole bunch of life. But then you have to realize that was only a local extinction. What affected the rest of the world was the effects on the atmosphere. That all that dust and soot getting shot up to the sky completely blocked out the sun. Without sunlight, you can't have photosynthesis. And without that photosynthesis, terrestrial and ocean ecosystems can completely collapse in a very short time period which seemed to occur paleontologists estimate within even a year a whole bunch of extinction events occurred without that energy entering the system you know the small stuff that depends on that sunlight starts to die out and as a result of them dying out all the big stuff dies out because they starve to death which is depressing but 
That's what happens. Paleontologists speculate this is the main case because in that K to PG boundary, the Cretaceous to Paleogene boundary that happened 66 million years ago, that they find a whole bunch of iridium that only comes from extraterrestrial sources in those meteorites. So since they're finding that worldwide, they speculate that had to have entered the atmosphere and then be deposited in those rocks. So it's speculation, you know, seems like some of them make a strong case about it, but it's still a hypothesis. It hasn't been proven without a doubt. The first paper, which was titled neo Shalation Diversity Across the Cretaceous to Tertiary Boundary, seemed to mention in the introduction that there are alternate hypotheses that could have also been factors in these extinctions, including extended periods of volcanism, changes in sea level, climate changes, and etc. local factors. It definitely wasn't gradual, whereas all these sharks and dinosaurs and all the rest of the groups died gradually over time because they, for the most part, were increasing in diversity, and then something happened in a very short period of time, a whole bunch of them just completely went extinct and or you had them surviving on the fringes i've heard of people believing that hadrosaurs survived but it seems that most of that is due to fossils washing into another formation making it seem younger than it actually is but i won't bore you over the thoughts of the exact causes of the kt extinctions there's so many other lectures and books that are worthy of a whole podcast But here, we're mainly going to, again, discuss the effects on sharks and how they started to rebound. So back to the first paper, which was Neosalation Diversity Across the Cretaceous to Tertiary Boundary. That was by Jurgen Krewet and Michael Benton. This came out a little over 10 years ago. It stated in the paper, there was major extinction events for calcareous nanoplankton, planktonic and benthic foraminifera which were little diatoms that formed the base of many marine ecosystems. Ammonites, oh yeah, that's another group that went completely extinct. Bellumnites, which were squid-like forms. Bivalves, bryozoans, brachiopods, echinoids, corals, and probably ostracods and gastropods, which include snails, are indicated by a paper in 2001. And that was probably why it would also stay in this paper how rays or batoids which includes skates and rays those went even more extinct than sharks which i believe has a direct impact from the extinction of all those invertebrates that it was feeding on on the bottom yeah so because they're so specialized in those invertebrates once they die out they're pretty much screwed they don't really have many alternatives where sharks can cover more ground and whatever they can fit in their mouths The problem was, all those big sharks that needed so much prey to survive and thrive, they just couldn't do it. And those losses of sharks included all of family Anacoracidae, which included the infamous Squalacorax, which their teeth, I actually have a couple of them, I picked up at a fossil fest down in Venice. They look very similar to tiger sharks. They're very, very modern looking shark teeth. You would expect that they would thrive in current conditions. So you know it really had to be bad for them to go extinct. As well as family Crotoxyrhinidae and Scapanorhyinchidae, which include goblin sharks, but not the deep sea goblin sharks. They were more offshore, fairly shallow water, generalist goblin sharks. Of course, the family Crotoxyrhina That's most famous because of the Gensu shark, which can be found with fossils in the middle of the United States. But you wonder, why are you finding shark teeth in the middle of the United States? There's no ocean there. Well, there was in the mid to late Cretaceous when sea levels were much, much higher because there's much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There was no glaciers at the poles, if I remember correctly. And even Florida was completely underwater at that time, at least mostly underwater. It was a shallow sea. And I'm sure, you know, that's my home state. If there were Cretaceous outcrops, there wouldn't be any dinosaurs or next to no dinosaurs. There would be mostly shark teeth, maybe mosasaur fossils, ammonites, that sort of thing. I can't remember. There might have been some uh, drill cores with ammonites 
from Florida because I believe there are some Cretaceous deposits, but you have to drill down to get to them. But I digress. Actually, it appears the Cretaxi-Hrina family didn't die out completely at the KPG boundary. It appears that Paleocarcharodon, which was one of the top predators in the Paleocene after the dinosaurs, survived to make the lineage survive on a little bit longer, but they're the sole exception, whereas the Cretodus and the Gensu shark, the Cretaxi-Hrina mantelli, were the main ones, but those big ones had died out well before the mass extinction. I don't know exactly why. That would be a topic for another discussion. Maybe they were outcompeted by Mosasaurus, but I'm not completely sure. The second paper, which I'll try not to skip between two papers too much, stated they are studying Moroccan teeth from the late Maastrichtian, which that was the last age of the Cretaceous, and the start of the Paleocene was the Danian. So at the late Maastrichtian, the apex predator shark was a species of Squalicorax, which again, are those laminiform sharks that have teeth that are blunt and serrated, kind of like tiger shark teeth. They didn't get too big. I saw a picture of them in a rough diagram. I think they only grew to about Squalicorax pristodontus only seemed to grow to about 4 meters long, which was 12 feet, which is not a small shark by any means. Well, it is compared to Megalodon, many sharks that came before and after it, but it was still a sizable shark with impressive teeth, and they went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So that was how bad it was. So the first paper by Crowett and Benton, it depended on what data they included in their models doing computer modeling to uncover the most likely extinction rates. So with dubious data, it seemed that there was 34 plus or minus 10% of all genera of sharks and rays and 45 plus or minus 9% loss of species. That includes sharks and rays. And of rays or batoids, about 65% went extinct in total. So that, that's pretty hard hit. That probably affected sharks too, as sharks eat rays. I don't know too much about their dietary preferences in the Cretaceous, except that Squalicorax is known to scavenge on dinosaurs, but I'm sure they probably mostly ate fish, because that's what's sustainable. Fish and maybe invertebrates or other sharks. And it's pretty cool. Actually, days ago, there was a paper on a Cretoxyhrina shark, evidence of it eating the pterosaur Pteranodon. I thought it was really neat, but it's pretty much common sense that sharks will eat anything that they're able to. But anyways, because the fossil record isn't perfect, there's the Signor Lips problem where the fossil record mostly provides what is abundant and all over the place, so you can never pinpoint the exact origination and the exact extinction of any shark or any species. So. It requires a lot of data to really have those exact data points or to be close to it which is why I included more than one paper on this topic and even the first paper actually they're doing this experiment through a database which is why they have fluctuating data but overall it's pretty clear that there were sizable extinctions of sharks at that KT boundary and there's a problem with Lazarus taxa, which is where sharks that seem to disappear in the fossil record, but we know they didn't go extinct because they later reappear in the fossil record, which goes back to that signor lips problem. You can't know exactly where species go extinct because you don't always see them, but they still might be there. And I remember, I think it happened with the end Permian as well as the end Cretaceous where corals completely disappear from the fossil record but they couldn't have gone completely extinct because they're with us now but some of these large predators those squalicorax those mosasaurs etc they most likely had to have gone extinct because they don't reappear even though sharks weren't that huge in the maastrichtian they were pretty abundant and pretty diverse that is that age was 72.1 to 66 million years ago but once the KT boundary hit, all those large sharks just died out, and not all of them appear in the fossil record. Unsurprised, Odontaspis, which was a sand tiger shark, was a Lazarus taxa for the Danian. So it didn't appear in the latest Cretaceous, 
but it reappeared in the Danian. So overall, because sharks were so hard hit by that mass extinction, over 60 Neosalation genera went extinct, 61 plus or minus 10. By the time of the Danian, only 31 genera were encountered for the first time, which was 32% of Neosalation genera. So there was more loss than rebounding overall between those two periods. And it took time. As stated earlier in the paper, shark diversity didn't completely rebound to the levels it was before the mass extinction until the late Paleocene, if not the early Eocene. So the Eocene, that was the time when shark diversity was really taken off. And those new Carcharinoform sharks which are famous for having the broad cutting teeth for the uppers and their narrow clutching teeth on the bottom for the most part, they didn't really appear until after the end Cretaceous, which you see papers, I'll get into this, this is on the third paper, where general websites describing this paper said that the extinctions directly influenced and caused these modern shark groups to thrive but really it's largely because so many lamniforms went extinct it gave these more modern sharks more opportunity to evolve and thrive but when dubious data was included it was actually 59 percent extinction rate in sharks and rays in the Maastrichtian and 44 percent origination rates in the Danian so regardless of how much data was included there's more extinction rates than origination rates. And of the families that went extinct, 43% of the total Neosalation families were sharks and 57% were from rays. Which again, you know, those bat toys, those rays, most likely hard hit because of their loss of that prey, those prey items. Man, you know when there's mass extinctions of all those plankton and all those invertebrates you know it's really going to hit the fan which is in part why I worry so much sometimes about the current affairs of climate change the change of the pH in the ocean that's a whole nother topic and of the sharks it was mostly those medium to large size mostly fast swimming open ocean in the epipelagic and shelf zones that they weren't even all that specialized they had a wide range of what they ate those large active sharks went extinct which included Paranomotodon which is a medium sized shark that seemed to have small thresher shark like teeth of course Squalicorax Crotoxyrhina which the paper stated may have been possibly specialized or at least more specialized compared to other sharks that went extinct and the goblin sharks, Scapa panorhorynchus, which were the goblin sharks. And I found this surprising, or maybe it shouldn't be, that carpet sharks, or the orectobimorphs, they were heavily affected, as well as the batoids, all those predators that have those grinding teeth to eat those hard shell prey. Which, in mass extinction events, I would think the most highly predatory that need a lot of prey would be most heavily affected but here of course you have the ones that eat invertebrates especially on the bottom that were most heavily affected but then when you take a step further you look at the deep water sharks they didn't seem to be affected very much at all by the KT boundary and I believe this goes back to the effect of the blotting out of the sun that because those ocean systems don't rely on sunlight as much, the prey items were still there, so the predators down there were still there too. And the discussion discusses similar studies. One found that before their research that only 16% of genera went extinct at the KT, but they included chimeras, which are mostly deep sea dwelling, so they're not as affected as much. So that number is way too low. Whereas a Moroccan study found that there were higher extinction and higher origination rates. About 72% of genera extinct, which were 32.5% sharks and 40% batoids. So regardless, more rays are going extinct than sharks. And 70% of genera, 43% sharks, 27% batoids appeared in the Danian. So sharks 
had lower extinction rates and higher origination rates. So it was, it was not a great time to be a shark at that period, but not too shabby. But as I'll go into the next paper, it makes it seem really doom and gloom for that KT boundary as shark tooth patterns changed drastically. So this paper called Ecological Impact of the End Cretaceous Extinction on Lamniform Sharks by Rachel A. Belbin and several other authors which came out in 2017, originally written in 2016. And they found that the post-Cretaceous ecosystems, quote, supported lower diversity and disparity of lamniforms and were dominated by significantly smaller sharks with slimmer, smoother, and less robust teeth. Basically, it goes on to say how shark teeth in the latest Cretaceous seem to fairly resemble modern shark teeth, especially modern large lamniform teeth. Whereas the earliest Danian, mostly all you find are small sand tiger like teeth, which are not very exciting. Which the predator fossil record is a direct reflection on the available prey. So there was not very much prey available, not a lot of large stuff for them to carve up and munch on. So the small ones survived, and that's what really thrived for at least a short period of time. So whereas the first paper was mostly describing the extinction rates, this one was more in depth about the shark teeth and how they changed before and after the mass extinction. And they were really putting in a lot of data to describe the teeth, which included teeth from before the mass extinction, right after the mass extinction, and actually they included modern shark teeth to see which modern lamniform shark teeth would correlate with. And there's 13 key ecomorphological characters and nine parameters to describe their teeth morphology, to describe their feeding type, which included serrations, cusp heights, base cusp width, cusp split to cusp ratio, the cusp splits being like an Ododus obliquus, but also was common among Cretaceous lamniform sharks where there'd be the main cusp, the main blade, and on the shoulder there'd be two side cusps. That's what the cusplets are. Width ratios, depth ratios, and several other characters. And they found that over the extinction, only two of the 13 morphometric variables remain constant, which was labial to lingual curve, which I even see that in teeth I find. That curve, how it curves from the front to back, doesn't really change all that much and tooth inclination. Both of those are pretty basic. If it's not broken, why fix it? Other than that, all kinds of widths, cusp split to cusp ratio, the width of it, all that changed because of those different environmental conditions. The marine ecosystem environment in general is completely different where they didn't have as much prey so they had to get those slimmer teeth or that's at least that's what survived. There's a really good chart toward the end of the paper that showed the general abundance and the size, the shape of the teeth that were more common. And you see much more uh, diversity in the Cretaceous teeth. They're more broad, there's more of them. Whereas with the Danian teeth, there's just not all that much to them. So the Danian, the most common species was Striatolamia whitei, which resemble small sand tiger teeth below that much less abundant were Odontaspis speyuri, which also resemble sand tiger teeth. Whereas in the late Cretaceous Maastrichtian, you had the Serratolamna maracana, which fairly resemble odudus like teeth with the side cusps in the. I'm not sure if it's serrated or not, but the tooth cusp was fairly broad. They found more of their teeth, and of course, their bigger teeth. And you also had the squalocorax, the pseudocorax. Another Serratolamna species, Anomododon, which was also found in the Danian but less abundant, and another species of Anomododon. And I found it interesting in the Danian, you also had Creta Lamna, which that gave rise to the Mako sharks, and if I remember correctly, also Ododus, which eventually gave rise to Megalodon. So I find it surprising you don't really find it in the Cretaceous, but you find it in the Danian, and they're fairly small. I think. They only grew to like 10 feet. I have a chart here. Yeah, so Striatolamia. Wow, that was a small shark. It only seemed to grow to about 1 meter or 3 feet. I don't know if that's average or the max size. So yeah, definitely 
like a baby sand tiger. It looks like the biggest shark from that period, from this diagram I'm looking at, was Creta Lamna, which grew about to one and a half meters, or between three to six feet. So you really didn't have that much diversity and not that much size, but over time it definitely picked up. It took millions of years. I found even in an online website, the Paleocarcharodon, their teeth weren't even serrated for the first species in the Danian. It took time for them to grow bigger and get those serrations. And it's real interesting, there's actually a term for this effect, the temporary dwarfing of surviving species. It's called the lilyput effect. Whereas sharks didn't grow that big, but over time, as their prey diversified, they definitely regained that diversity and regained the size. But it definitely took at least a few million years after that mass extinction. Discussion compares the late Cretaceous shark teeth to modern shark teeth, whereas the teeth are very similar, so they must have had similar prey preferences. Whereas the early Danian, they basically just resemble juvenile sharks and I imagine they must have been chasing whatever fish they could come across because fish didn't completely die out, the bony fish. We still have plenty of those, but definitely took time for them to diversify. And it wasn't until the early Eocene where you had a lot of modern fish groups finally appear. Whereas with sharks, even sharks, a lot of modern species didn't arise until later in the very warm, very diverse seas of the Eocene. Which I'm sure I'll make podcasts about that time period. That's where the snaggletooth, tiger sharks, and all kinds of carcharinoform sharks first appeared. It even stated toward the end of the paper that the absence of these medium to large sized sharks may reflect local rarity of more pelagic and outer shelf teleos, which are bony fish, crustaceans, and coleoids, which are cephalopods, after the end Cretaceous. Still crazy how much ocean life just completely just disappeared or became rare after that mass extinction because before this I think I'd mostly thought about the end Permian as a nasty extinction but even though life recovered a few million years after the end Cretaceous it was still pretty bad and it's pretty sudden there's no doubt about that it took time for all kinds of predators to rebound and for new opportunities which will get us to the next paper so the third and final paper we will be discussing Static dental disparity and morphological turnover in sharks across the end Cretaceous mass extinction. This is by Mohamed Bazi, several other authors. This actually came out of August of 2018, and it's pretty similar to the second paper, except they didn't study as many variables in the shark teeth. They mainly focused on whether they were tall and thin or broad and short. The main finding was quote specific patterns indicate that an asymmetric extinction occurred among lamiforms possessing low crowned and triangular teeth which is basically those pseudocorax and squalocorax and other types serrato lamna and that a subsequent proliferation of carcharoniforms with similar tooth morphologies took place during the early paleocene because basically prior research had found that lamniforms still dominated the oceans in the Paleocene, and maybe they did, but even though Carcharoniforms definitely started to take over in that Eocene, which was 56 to around 34 million years ago, this research found that Carcharoniforms had actually started to occupy the morphous space of previous lamniforms, that they were already taking over some of those niches or competing for that space basically stated what they were doing in that early Paleocene laid the foundation for their extensive diversification later in the Cenozoic, especially during that Eocene period. They really had that explosive diversity. It's still around today. There's over 250 Carcharoniforms and only 15 species of Lamniform. I mean, and if you look back at the Cretaceous, it was the complete opposite, you know, Carcharoniforms were restricted to those small cat sharks and hound sharks. When I talk about triacid sharks, that's the hound sharks. Those gave rise to those more advanced carcharoniform sharks like the tiger sharks, the bull sharks, hammerheads, etc. The most surprising aspect of this paper was that it found there's no significant decrease in shark abundance across Cretaceous to Paleogene boundary, which it basically said other papers had overestimated or at least it seemed like it's 
stated they overestimated the amount of extinctions whereas yeah sure the bigger ones with those big broad short teeth compared to the skinny long teeth went extinct but overall the extinctions were pretty moderate although it does continue to state how the extinction of the anacoracids that led to the subsequent rise of the triacids although it makes it clear that the triacids definitely didn't outcompete them they just took advantage of those empty niches and that it divided up the types of teeth the carcharoniform sharks weren't competing for those big broad serrated low crown teeth yet it was mainly the type of teeth that was slender and clutching those types they were starting to really resemble those lamniforms and there was less of those types of abundant sharks among the lamniforms so basically it called it a top-down tropic cascade because as those more ancient lamniform I wouldn't call them more ancient they're still fairly modern although they really resemble tiger shark teeth although tiger sharks came much later but the track is started to occupy those niches with their type of teeth and they weren't super common I don't think but they were definitely getting there bony fish or at least acanthomorph fish which I assume are teleos I'm pretty sure they are yeah acanthomorph fish include several modern groups including the oarfish trout perches dories cods etc that general group started to radiate in the Paleocene definitely seems like whatever sharks were radiating whatever sharks were thriving probably largely in part to the diversification of these new fish and it states overall these extinctions no direct link between the decline of anacoracids and rise of triacids but more so seemed there is top-down tropic cascade whereby extinctions at the apex of the food chain triggered a mesopredator release this has happened several times with other groups where those top apex predators go extinct and the smaller predators have an opportunity to seize those new niches and they don't always directly replace them at first but they can definitely move and start to occupy those niches and over time they can definitely start competing for those and over time take over those niches which seems to really have occurred with those gray sharks because if you look at hound sharks modern hound sharks aren't really much to look at they're nectobenthic hunters swimming near or on the bottom and they eat small fish and vertebrates but they have that heterogeneous dentitions capable of clutching cutting and crushing basically most to all carcharoniforms have those cutting and clutching types of teeth which lamniforms more so lack so although lamniforms can still pretty much eat whatever they can whatever they can sink their teeth into if they don't have those crushing types of teeth they can't eat as many invertebrates although they can probably swallow them ever in books they have really good digestion systems but overall they won't be as adept as more generous type predators which is why I believe carcharioniforms overall became more successful over time along with the expansion of types of prey that they seized upon and those tracked hound sharks aren't of course apex predators or if they are they're really specialized ecosystems they include some cute sharks including the leopard shark is a hound shark the leopard shark only grows to around four to five feet long which is 1.2 to 1.5 meters they're most common near the coast in less than four meters or 13 feet of water but they have a wide range of what they eat including fish eggs bony fish shrimp crabs other invertebrates that's at least for the leopard shark but overall this paper states there was pretty static dental disparity over the mass extinction but this contradicts the findings of the second paper which stated the teeth changed a whole lot which I believe the second paper more because they studied more variables they didn't just study the overall trend of how short and broad or long and thin the teeth are in case you read the paper it states PC1 and PC2 a lot the PCI index was the ratio of the narrow tall teeth and the PC2 was the ratio of those broad low crown teeth and of course as those extinctions took place those lamniforms with the PC2 type those broad relatively low crown teeth went extinct probably because they were less adept 
at catching fish which were pretty rare around that time period they're getting there because of those planktonic and the overall invertebrate communities collapsing so they needed to catch whatever they could find and also because there was less abundant prey it was the small types that were surviving because most sharks are cold-blooded so they don't have to constantly eat they can survive weeks if not months without food which is also why crocodiles survived the mass extinction whereas dinosaurs did not although i can't speak for every species there seemed to have been a lot of small stuff that went extinct as well but as far as what survived there's definitely aspects that helped them that we know about such as being cold-blooded and small they don't require as much food and being adaptable generalist predators that can eat a wide range of foods that definitely helps although a lot of sharks that went extinct were not super specialized so you know of course the conditions were pretty bad and there's a lot of heightened competition going on and of course that's why we call it a mass extinction because a lot of things were going extinct that shouldn't have been under ideal conditions i'd recommend watching my two-part extinction lecture under my youtube channel dman 9fp there's so many factors that go into extinctions besides who's the strongest of the strong if conditions are super horrible it gets harder and harder to survive and pass on those genes and what is favorable to live in dire situations becomes more common and those survivors contribute to the future of the gene pool whereas if you go extinct those species just disappear although again you have those Lazarus taxa named after the biblical character because sometimes although something disappears in the fossil record it might still be alive in some part across the world or they're just not very abundant they don't fossilize as much but overall many sharks disappeared completely shark teeth are pretty common in the fossil record there's no doubt that many went extinct as well as many of those other groups like the dinosaurs pterosaurs the spiral shelled cephalopods called ammonites just there's no appearance of them and especially plesiosaurs i can't believe people believe those things are still around there's absolutely no fossils of them and they live in the oceans where hard parts generally fossilize very well so they're definitely extinct and this paper even states there was a minor decline of carcharoniform sharks too which were generally small those small triacid and cat sharks things were so bad even they went extinct around four percent of them went extinct although it states it was somewhat debatable I don't know if that's just because it conflicted with their data. They seem to argue it, it might have been a sampling issue that somebody could have been more careful about. But you never know. You have to look at more papers and keep an open mind to really know what's going on. Although it didn't really clear up that issue. These extinctions overall affected many shark groups. Again, almost 50% of all sharks went extinct depending on how much data you include somewhere between 40 to 50 plus percent of sharks went extinct especially hard hit again those large laminiforms and especially the rays those batoids that ate invertebrates were really hard hit because they depend on all those invertebrates those invertebrates were even harder hit because they really depend on those plankton and there's max extinction among plankton which i was surprised i was researching earlier I was reading in a book that was stating evidence from a 1997 paper stating that the impact theory is not very valid because there was not a mass extinction among those small planktonic groups. Although in some of these papers it does state there was a decline in those planktonic groups. So I'm going to trust the newer papers but I always have an open mind and that book which by Prothero after the dinosaurs is a great book for studying trends on the Cenozoic. It stated an alternate hypothesis that there are lowering sea levels. And there was a lot of tectonic activity going on throughout the Cretaceous. So I can't disclude that possibility and or volcanism with climate change. There's definitely a lot of volcanism occurring in the Cretaceous. Again, I'm no Cretaceous expert, so I'm open to any criticisms and or additional insights. I'm just stating what these papers are saying and what makes the most sense to me. I'll be the first to admit when I'm wrong, you know. It's all about finding answers or the most truth to shed light on how it was. I care more about that than my ego. So yeah, thanks for listening. 
to the podcast. Covered more works than I've ever reviewed before. I knew it was going to be a risk covering three papers and some other additional insights in passing from other works. But this is a complex, pivotal point in shark evolution history. I just found it necessary to cover more than one or two papers. And again, I'm open to additional insights, data sets, although these papers are fairly recent, pretty extensive, seem to have some really good data, and I'll stand by these findings until they're overturned for the time being. Yeah, that end of Cretaceous, pretty bad for most any group, especially those shallow marine apex predators. Although again, though it was pretty hard hit on invertebrates too. And of course, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, those lovers of those groups are probably, they probably want to slap me across the face or something because what do I have to complain about? Because sharks are still around. They're my favorite group, whereas many other special groups that survived and thrived for millions of years completely died out. And I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible in this podcast and throughout the work of my channel, my blog, etc. But... There are definitely aspects that help them survive and thrive, and I hope I covered that really well. If I didn't, I'll strive to show that in future videos. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Any recommendations for future papers, if you have a favorite species, a favorite time period, definitely speak up. I'm pretty sure I have the general idea of what I want to cover in my second episode fairly soon. I'm trying to create a backlog of this podcast to really kickstart it. And I hope that really goes well. Besides that, personal updates, uh, playing some tennis here and there. I fairly recently started a new diet trend. I've been eating mushrooms every day. And I think it is helping me mentally. Although I've also been drinking coffee. I think that really helps too. But I don't know. I believe those mushrooms, they're either giving me a testosterone boost or just help in my general mental state. Although I've also been trying to only eat within a 12 hour time frame. I think that's also been helping me as well. And besides that, same old working on this podcast, which I'm really excited for. Wow, I I have over an hour. I know once I edit this, it'll probably be at least 45 minutes. But uh, yeah, I think that's it. All right, thanks for listening. See you guys.